Okay, good, well, good evening, brothers and sisters, so for those present here and those of you who are listening online. Uh, welcome to our talk entitled Continuing the Legacy. Um, during this festival, we are celebrating the lives of many heroes, thousands of heroes who have dedicated their lives in the shaping and forming of our Catholic Church in the last 200 uh, years. And we hope that uh, for those who are listening online and here, that through this series of talks and our sharings, we hope that we hope we can inspire you uh, to also maybe walk uh, in their footsteps. Very importantly, continuing in their legacy as we collectively as a church now begin to write the ch new chapters for, Singapore for the next 200 years. I'm going to share uh, this talk with two other people today. Uh, we, I have with me Colin Ong and Audrey. Yeah? Colin is going to start today's talk uh, with his personal conversion story that started as early as his childhood primarily because of his primary school, being in a Catholic school, right? And how many, many years thereafter, it continues to impact not only his life, but that of his family and his children. Um, after Colin, I'm going to take some time to share with you the work that we do for refugee children uh, in Malaysia. Uh, we'll share about the joys, the, chug the struggles, the, the challenges, but very importantly, the, the, the potential of, of this work. And then we're going to have Audrey, who's going to come forward. Audrey is one of our latest member uh, online teachers for children. And she's going to share her personal experience as, uh, and her journey with the refugee children. So if I may invite Colin to come forward and start the sharing. Right. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, my brothers and sisters, for um, allowing me to share uh, the impact uh, of Catholic education on me, and uh, particularly on uh, in uh, uh, introducing the faith to me, uh, and, and why I'm Catholic today, because of Catholic education. Um, and I'd like to start off by um, uh, saying that um, uh, I didn't grow up Catholic. Um, uh, I, in fact, I came from a, ca uh, a non-Catholic uh, family, a Taoist family, and not just uh, uh, nominally Taoist. Uh, my, my mother and father uh, both uh, were pretty staunch uh, Taoists. And in fact, uh, if I can remember, my mom would actually take me to the temple um, uh, and uh, uh, to see a, uh, a medium, a Taoist medium. And this uh, Taoist medium, um, whenever I go there, it was, there was always fear and trepidation. And, uh, and, and that's uh, uh, why um, I'm sorry, sorry, just trying to compose myself a little bit. Um, and, and that actually uh, made me very, very fearful every time I go to the temple. And, but by the grace of God, um, uh, one second, by the grace of God, uh, my mom uh, managed to choose a Catholic school for me. And uh, that was, uh, uh, okay, sorry, can I, can I start over again? <laughs> it's okay. Okay, let me let me start over again. I think uh, uh, there's a little jitters. <laughs> just let me shake it off first. Yeah, just just let me shake it off. Let me shake it off. Let me shake it off. Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. Let me just let me shake it off. Okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, let me let me start. Let me start again. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. My name is Colin Ong, and uh, I come from the Church of Divine Mercy. Um, and today I'm going to share with you uh, the story of my Catholic conversion uh, because of Catholic education. Um, and, um, and I'm going to share with you um, uh, the perspective of uh, me uh, as a, uh, uh, from, a, from, a, from a person that from the eyes of an adolescent, right? Somebody uh, who is non-Catholic, and um, and <laughs> sorry, I gotta start again. So sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. I'm just got some jitters. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me start again. Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, my name is Colin Ong. And I come from the Church of Divine Mercy. And uh, today I'm going to share about uh, Catholic education 
and how it's actually impacted me and allowed me to be a Catholic uh, today. And, um, and oh, one second, let me compose myself. Okay, let me start. Okay. So sorry. Third try, third take. Third take, so sorry. Okay, 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 sorry, so sorry. I know, I should have. Uh, because I wanted to talk in front of but when I see a camera down there, I panic. Okay, okay, I don't want to look at a camera. I don't want to look at a camera. Yeah, I'm sorry, I have a camera. I thought I must perform, you see. Oh my goodness. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so I cut that out. Okay, okay, okay. Bali, Bali, Bali. Ah, oh, yeah, Bali, okay. Cut that out of the things. This side. Ah, yo. No, that, look at the camera, I feel so unnatural. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I've introduced myself, Colin Ong, from the Church of Divine Mercy. Um, and um, I'm going to share a bit about uh, Catholic education and how it actually impacted me and how I became Catholic because of Catholic education. Um, and uh, I'm going to share with you through the eyes of somebody uh, who is non-Catholic and actually an adolescent. Okay? And uh, growing up, I wasn't Catholic. I come from a family of Taoists. And... Um, let, me, let me use the mic here. It'll be easier for me to talk. Uh, and uh, my mom, uh, we were not just nominally uh, Taoist. Uh, we grow, uh, my mom would actually take me to uh, a medium, a Taoist in a medium in a Taoist temple. And every time uh, when I go to that temple, I will always come, go with fear and trepidation uh, because uh, the, the medium uh, will always be angry always uh, be shouting and at that time I always thought, hey, is that actually the face of God, right? Uh, but by the grace of uh, God, my mom actually uh, put me into um, uh, chose St. Michael's, which is a Catholic school uh, uh, and because she's heard so much about the quality of Catholic education. Um, and so um, during my time in St. Michael's, I, I, I would say that I didn't have any inclination for, or towards religion. Because um, I was young then, uh, and those days were just filled with, other than school homework, it was uh, playing football, what I call chaos football, uh, actually you now. And uh, you know, marbles, uh, and uh, playing catching, etc. So. Uh, I, I don't remember a whole lot of things, but what I do remember uh, are the dedicated teachers. Uh, and this is just a cute shout out to uh, the educators there. I remember Mr. Tan Siang An of, uh, that taught me in upper primary. Uh, and Mrs. Sylvia Yeo, uh, both were kind and good teachers. Mr. Tan Siang An, he, um, he, would, teach, he would treat us like uh, young adults, uh, and that was uh, pretty advanced during that time, uh, and uh, very progressive, in fact. And Mrs. Yo, oh my goodness, Mrs. Yo was a strict teacher, but it kept us all in a row. Uh, but we loved them, right? It was the teachers, we, we loved them still. I mean, the last homecoming that we had, uh, all the old boys were actually clamoring to actually take photos with her. So. Uh, that's my small tribute to, uh, to them. And then, uh, but it's through their dedication that they got us, uh, they got me into SGI. Uh, the SGI just across the street, right? Uh, so, uh, where me and Chris 
uh, graduated from. We were last batch, actually, uh, to graduate from Brass Plaza. So, uh, when in, so we are really are the old boys. Huh? Uh, and, um, and to continue, just to give the tribute to the teachers, uh, the educators again, it was uh, Mr. Marcel Lee. Uh, Mr. Marcel Lee, uh, I remember him uh, because he, um, you can imagine, uh, there's a recent picture of him. Um, see, oops. That's a recent picture of him, I believe. And on the right, that's a young teacher then who actually took his time to uh, take us, uh, uh, sacrificing his own time, but took us a trip, a uh, camp to St. John's Island. And that's a trip that I won't forget, right? Um, and he treated us uh, like uh, his younger brother. And he's somebody we can relate to. So I always remember Mr. Marcel Lee, and because of his passion and dedication to education, and, and that's why he became the principal uh, subsequently as, uh, with uh, St. Gabriel's as well. And then there's brother on the right, and there's uh, brother Oliver Rogers, whom I remember. Uh, brother Oliver Rogers, he was, um, he was strict but firm, right? And, uh, and, and genuinely concerned for, for his students. Uh, and uh, these are the teachers uh, I won't uh, forget. But it was the formative, my formative years in SJI uh, that got me uh, into an a, a affinity with the Catholic faith. And how? And that's because of the Catholic ethos that was in practice. And I think a lot of us uh, uh, going to Catholic schools, we may have taken this for granted. And I said, I'm saying this uh, because you know this. I'm looking at it through the eyes of a non uh, non Catholic, right? So uh, the morning assembly, where the morning prayers were said, um, that this whole uh, experience about everybody saying the, the, the Our Father, the prayers together, right? That had an, an effect and an impact on me. Um, uh, that's the first time I actually learned the Our Father. Um, and it was always uh, led by this man, the, the, the principal at that time, his, uh, Brother Kevin Byrne. And I always remember him because um, he would constantly be exhorting this God uh, to uh, give us, um, uh, to protect us, to give us blessings, right? And I always felt that he was, this is a, a, a man of God, a holy person. Uh, and that's what I remember him. You know, he always, he, he was kind. Uh, he never taught me though, but I have great respect for him because of, of that. And I also want to share with you, just like the morning prayers, it was always an invitation. It was never imposing, right? They never imposed on us to say the Our Father. And it was also my first spiritual experience where um, I can't remember the situation. I can't remember the, um, um, uh, what, what it was. Maybe it was a feast day. But it was... Um, um, they invited secondary ones into this very cathedral itself. Uh, they invited non-Catholics. And when I went uh, in, um, uh, I felt peace. Uh, I felt uh, serenity. Um, and uh, I felt that this definitely was a sacred place. It's a holy place. I didn't understand it at that time. But um, definitely, uh, now, I mean, now I know it's, it's definitely the Holy Spirit. In any case, uh, there were many uh, educators that uh, uh, I had a good impression on and, and impacted my life. Uh, many of the Christian brothers, um, um, and definitely they were uh, Catholic ethos personified. But uh, one very uh, one person I, I like to uh, pay tribute to is is uh, Brother Patrick Lowe. And Brother Patrick Lowe, uh, when he taught religious studies and he taught Bible studies to me, uh, and he created a deep impression on me because he went off the curriculum one day and he taught 
uh, and he shared the uh, the story of the of the shroud of Turin, and for at that time for me, uh, that was the uh, historical real evidence of of Christ, all right, uh, hard evidence of Christ, and 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 I was really intrigued and I was uh, totally captivated, and and that. Uh, actually made an impact on me uh, in my journey. Um, uh, so um, these are people that, um, um, that I remember. And fast forward uh, um, in CJC. Uh, this time it was the community, and what I deem the community, that actually nudged me uh, into the faith. Uh, so. Um, in the earlier portions, it was the educators, right, that impact, that impact me. The next came the Catholic ethos of the school. And now, it was the, the community. Now, <clears throat> what do I mean by the community? Um, so, um, well, the, the story goes like this, right? So, I... A girl that I fancied in the CJC, and um, um, well, I don't know if since if this is recorded, right? It's, uh, talking about a girl that I fancy, <laughs> I I just I got I just gotta say out that hey, you know, darling, you know, you're the best. I love you, you know. I'm just recounting a story. <laughs> I just gotta cover myself, okay? But it was this girl that um, that introduced me to. Uh, the group uh, in, uh, the f of people from the Legion of Mary. Now, I don't know what the Legion of Mary was at that time. Um, I have no idea what they do, who they are, um, but they warmly welcomed me um, and they befriended me. And in fact, the next speaker, you can see actually uh, Chris James is there. Uh, the one next to the person that's uh, wrapped in toilet roll. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and uh, they not only welcomed me with open arms, but they, they welcomed me, invited me to join the Christmas play. And it was at the Christmas, can you imagine? They, they invited me to the Christmas play and made me play the part of uh, Gabriel the angel. Right, I mean, uh, just uh, amazing because I don't know what they were thinking at the time because me is an angel, uh, but they brought the story of Christ uh, to me, a non-Catholic, um, and uh, on top of that, uh, during caroling, they invited me and they showed me a faith in action. Uh, bringing joy to the less privileged, the poor, raising funds and the camaraderie, the, the love they have for each other. And, and that definitely impacted me uh, a lot, right? Uh, so, um, and, and they sealed the deal, right? They sealed the deal for me. And uh, um, when I graduated from uh, a CJC at the age of uh, 19, uh, on my own accord, I actually uh, went to sign up RCIA and, uh, and then became uh, a Catholic. And it, it was not because of the girl uh, that I fancy. We went our separate ways <laughs> uh, after I went to the army. So, uh, and praise the, praise the Lord, right? I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic to this day. And, and the light continues from there, right? It's amazing how God actually uses uh, people to, um, to, to bring you closer to Him. And, um, and the light continues, how, how, it, how it continues. When I went overseas and when I met my uh, wife, then my girlfriend, uh, she wasn't Catholic. And after dating for just a year and bringing her for Mass, and she, con she converted her Catholic faith as well uh, within a year at the university chaplaincy. And, and today we are, we are happily uh, uh, married with two kids, and that's my daughter, Christy, 
It's my son, uh, Christopher, their first communion. And uh, I thank uh, God for, for this. And, and in concluding this, my, my brothers and sisters, um, I just want to say that I'm really very grateful to the early missionaries who have brought uh, the faith to, to our shores and, uh, and started Catholic institutions, right? And, and it's because of them that I got to know that uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And, and the Catholic Church is, has the fullness of truth. Okay, and with this, I, I, I thank you. And I'll pass this over to James, uh, who will talk about uh, Catholic edu bringing Catholic education in a different setting, a less privileged uh, uh, kids. James. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, for me, that was very real, you know, how this thing about mission work, the impact it has on one life, and it continues, and it continues, and it continues. And that's the reason why I'm really passionate about the work that I do. Because like Colin, you know, uh, this is unscripted, but I want to share with you, fairly similar. It was the brothers that impacted my life. It formed the way I think today. It formed my relationships that I built, uh, and it continues because that gets passed on. I want to share a little bit more about, let me see if this is, uh, the work that we do with refugee children uh, in Malaysia. They're about, but, but let me just give you a bit of context and a bit of a background what this whole environment is all about. There are about 180,000 refugees in Malaysia, right? Big number. Many people get uh, shocked when they hear this number. About 180,000 of them, the majority of them are from Myanmar, right? And we hear, myself and Claude, we hear many, many stories as to why families make that painful decision to pack up and flee their country. But one thing's clear is that the reasons for leaving the country, there's a common hope that we see, a, a hope that you, know, you and I can identify with. And that's hoping for a good future, a better future for ourselves and for our loved ones. The difference is that for these families, you know, that hope comes packaged, right? Uh, okay, and when that hope for a better future is what they look out for. That hope comes packaged when, when the UNHCR is able to relocate them, uh, either to the US, Australia, or New Zealand. Unfortunately, the wait is a long wait, because it can take anything between six to eight years before they get relocated. And in the case of here for Mary, Mary and her family of seven waited 15 years before they were finally relocated. Right. Now, while that weight may not be in a refugee camp, sorry, while that weight may not be in a refugee camp, you know, isolated from the world, staying in the city, being included in the world, doesn't necessarily make them any less liberated. Because being in the city and included, they still share that common identity with an illegal immigrant in the country, which means then they are vulnerable and exposed to the same. Yeah, you know, the difficulties, the challenges that uh, illegal immigrants face. In particular, children. Children are constantly reminded that the minute they leave their home, the homes, they've got to go under the radar. Because being in the wrong place and in the wrong time, they will be behind bars. And we unfortunately have had uh, the experience of our own children going through this, right? So can you imagine these children, the state of mind that they're in on a daily basis, as they walk out the house, they need to justify their existence, right? So that, that's what runs in, 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 a, in a refugee child. A typical family in the, in the refugee community is one whereby two or three families will, not, not something unfamiliar, but, but you have two or three families to huddle together and sometimes extended families in a rented apartment. And they all huddle together and the, the adult member will then try to find uh, hourly wait, uh, paid jobs to fend for their families. Children, on the other hand, who are left behind, and because they're considered illegal immigrants, uh, they cannot go to government schools. 
So they then find themselves enrolled in these loosely organized, poorly funded uh, refugee learning centers. And these learning centers will aim and do their best to try to educate the, their children. There are about, I think, 140 or such learning centers under the umbrella of the UNHCR. And, and the vast majority, with the exception of a few who may have the resources, but the vast majority will conduct their class in a manner whereby they'll put children right across all age groups, just put them together in this room like this, and then have either a, a, an adult member of the community to teach or a volunteer who comes and goes. Right? Um, something better than nothing. While it's true that something is better than nothing, often when you use this approach in the realm of education, it backfires. It backfires because when you use this approach, you know, you often end up, and most of them end up in a, uh, in a, in a structure where this, the classes are, you know, unstructured based on one, uh, the availability of teachers. So if they are teachers, then you have classes. If there are no teachers, then it's there's no class. Kids stay in an empty classroom, idling, waiting for time to pass by. And then the second thing that they, they're dependent on is the type of talent that the volunteers come to bring, right? They, they bring to the table. And in many instances, for example, when they have volunteers who maybe can only teach them music, the, the entire learning center can just sing all year round. <laughs> so they bring that case. But very importantly, it imparts the value to the child that there's no difference whether you do or you don't. Whether you do your homework, you don't do your homework, you excel, don't excel, because they don't have a regular pool of educators who can journey, monitor, uh, and guide them. Yeah? People go in, people come out, you know, there is, there isn't. That's what we impart to children if we adopt this. Something is better than nothing. So more often than not, we will find and we continue to find children who come out directionless, lost, confused, not very sure, even if they've attended these refugee learning centers, even if they've supposedly gone to, to school, right? And this problem gets compounded because, you know, we, as I firstly mentioned, that they spend a long time waiting. So many of them would have spent a large part, if not all part of their formative years in these refugee learning centers, that may not equip them with sufficient skills to be able to fend themselves, uh, especially when all of them are required to look after the family to be working uh, at the age of 15. So that hope that we spoke about in the beginning of a better future then gets passed on to the next generation and the next generation with nobody being able to realize it. Uh, for us at Fishing Rod, um, as the name suggests, we look at ways of uh, providing a personal rod for beneficiaries that will help, uh, help them fend for themselves in the future. We focus primarily in the area of education, and we take uh, a lot of inspiration from the lives of saints, religious, many people who share a common mission and a conviction that really the only way to get these children out of the poverty cycle is to give them fair and equal education. So what we do is we work with the refugee community, we work with the adult community at large to run a refugee learning center. In, in our case, we, we work with the Zotong refugee community to run the Zotong refugee Catholic learning center. And their involvement is very important because it also helps shape and form the views of the parents, many of whom have never gone to school, right? And in this center, we put in all our resources to give our children an education environment that is close to what a regular child would go to, right? And th many things that we take for granted, a, a proper classroom, assembly in the morning. You know, Colin spoke about prayers in the morning. We do that. Uh, a canteen for them to eat, education tools, all that so that it will mimic what a regular child would go to. We curate their, cur their curriculum, and Audrey will speak a little bit more about this. But whether it is the teaching of English, math, and science, the academics or the non-academics, whether it's sports or, or moral education, we do, we do all these things with three things in mind. One is we hope to improve their linguistic skills so that they can not only express themselves, but at least be, stood, be, be heard and understood. Two, we try constantly to impart that value of appreciating cause and effect. If I do this, this will happen. The cause and effect. 
And last but not least, to build that confidence in themselves so that they can uh, hopefully make decisions for themselves versus adopting the, the much prevalent view within this community that life is fated. I'm born poor and this is how it's going to be, so nothing that I do can make a change. So this has been for the people before me. We just wait and see. Um, we also we put an emphasis on our, to our children on the importance of giving back to society. And, and so we remind our children that they are the recipients of many good things. Huh? Good, a lot of uh, good people have donated their, for the rent, the teachers, etc. So while they may not be able to repay, we tell them that they can pay it forward. Uh, maybe not with money, but with the gift of their talent and their, uh, and their time. So what we've done in pre-COVID, we hope this will, will continue, but pre-COVID, we've done many CH, uh, CSR um, activities. This is an example of our children just, you know, during one of their field camps, going to uh, the beach and cleaning up. And every year, the children go up and they go caroling and they raise funds. Raise funds not for themselves, but for a Malaysian charity. In there, we have to be able to give back. So in, in, through these years, these children have been able to raise funds for students from Boys Town, the sick in, 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 uh, in Perch. Uh, we've been able to raise for the elderly, the little sisters, the poor, and even the Orang Asli through the Bodhimus Foundation. So they, but more importantly, when we allow the children to do this, we restore their dignity. Because a lot of these children, unfortunately, they suffer the, 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 the label that comes along with them being a refugee child and the prejudices that come along with them. So when these children do these things, giving back to society, and, and when they see the appreciation of the people around them, that look is priceless, huh? the pride and joy. Meet Amy. It's not, oh yeah, I was going to say, it's not one rot fits all. It's not. So I want to introduce Amy. Amy is a, a very determined refugee a teenager who set for her O levels as a private candidate on her own uh, using Google, some textbooks, set as a private candidate for O levels, and in two sittings, ob obtained a total of five A's and one B. Right? So we met up with her uh, two years ago, and as she, she was contemplating A levels, not knowing what to do, uh, we sat down, discussed the options before her, got her employed in a, uh, in a startup that will give her a breadth of experience for marketing, sales, customer service, supply chain, just to build that, that, that exposure for her, as well as to raise capital for herself. This year, two years later, when she was ready to do her A-levels, we put on a bursary uh, that provided her a, a laptop, a new laptop and, uh, and connectivity so she could do this course uh, online. So many people ask COVID, how mission can do, cannot do. The truth of the matter is, well, it is true that we can't get volunteers to go to the center and teach. COVID has actually opened up a whole new world of education opportunities for our children. And we're going to talk a little bit more online education. Just about two years ago, we were, we were, we were contemplating to provide some kind of digital training to our kids. We struggled. One, because it was just expensive, right? Uh, we got a lot of laptops, used laptops, working laptops. You can turn them on and off, but you can't use them for one line. Not good enough camera, not enough of RAM for video. But today, now with online classes being the norm and accepted, we can actually raise more funds so that every child can get a tablet and we can provide that connectivity. The other thing that really made it possible, in the past, even if we wanted to provide all this education, we, we couldn't find the volunteers. People who were tech-savvy enough to be able to come to the school. But, you know, today we find them all around the world. Literally, the world is our oyster. We already have 25 and it's growing. We have volunteers from Singapore, Malaysia, India, even in, and in the US. And as you will see later on, their experience is diverse. They are not the same. We have, yes, the retirees have got a lot of time in their hands, but we also have busy executives and professionals who may just want to dedicate that one hour a week we also have students, high school students in the U.S. who decided that they will do away that one hour of computer games and teach. So that's what it's been able to do. But very importantly, it's now sustainable, right? Not only are we able to collate this content, put them through Google Classroom, organize them, but very importantly, we now can make them available right across multiple learning centers. Huh? So... So mission impossible with COVID, no, it's mission possible. 
So as long as you can just maybe dedicate one hour a week, a maximum, or you can do less. <laughs> 40 hours an entire year, which is equivalent to no more than two mission days in a year. That we talk about this mission trips. And then you can create a sustainable impact on the lives of these children. So if you're listening online and you're having this itchy feeling like, ah, oh, I think I want to do Please don't overthink it, right? Put your hands up to God and ask Him to make it happen. If, if you ask me whether I would imagine half the things I'm doing today, I'll tell you no. Because like many, all the concerns of the world, family, money, work, and all that stuff made it very difficult. But just that one day when, when I say, yeah, maybe God, I want to do this, He made it possible. And Audrey will share with you the same thing with her. So I'd like to invite Audrey, our latest member who is an online uh, volunteer who is teaching uh, moral education. Thank you. So, uh, just for reference, this is the core image of my class for 2021. So the whole idea here is for me to uh, drum into the kids' minds that when they are trying to decide right and wrong, you know, they must always remember this. So I repeat this like almost every week, right? It was exam question as well. So very serious. Okay, but then on a serious note, um, um, when I started on this journey, uh, it was actually very incidental. So I have a friend, uh, we're all friends, so me and Chris know each other from way back. And a friend, a good friend of mine was actually a volunteer in the program already. So one day she said, hey, you know, we've got time. And then Chris somehow got in the act. And I said, never mind, you just go observe her first. Just observe. I know Chris is very, very charming because observe means do, la. I mean, quite fast. Eh? So observe for the thing. And, and my friend was doing actually the first batch of moral ed. And I got a bit panicky. I'm like, wow, so complicated. You know? it's like, so difficult to do. Um, and then Chris said, no, it's very easy. It's very easy. It's very easy. So nonetheless, anyway, long story short, so I'm, I'm in the program, right? So I wanted to share um, how, how, how we kind of teach the kids to fish, right? Because... The whole idea is not to do handouts and all that. It's to make them feel proud um, about the life they lead, despite the challenges that they have, okay? So I'll take you through four um, learnings for, for me the, the last one year. Um, I, I think as adults, um, sometimes it's very easy to, as Chris mentioned, to get very caught up in your own lives, right? Your family, your jobs, your careers, your, your friends, your social life, this and all that. So it's very easy to actually spend, you know, 24-7, you, yourself, my family, I, me, right? And, and I think this, this whole experience for me in the last year really spoke about how you take yourself out of yourself, right? And really kind of pay attention a bit to the world around you. So I'll give a little story. Uh, so I was doing a class that day and it was all about um, the concept of a goal ladder. So the idea was to teach the kids that, you know, it's good to have goals and ambitions and dreams, but sometimes we need to think about how we break it down so that, you know, it seems achievable, there are steps we can take and all that. So I came up with the idea of the goal ladder, right? And predictably, most of them came back with goals like, I want to be a better soccer player. Actually, one of the boys wanted to be an engineer, right? So I was like, oh, that's quite good. You can break down all these things to steps, huh? like, you know, practice, study, and all that. Um, but then one of the girls suddenly said that she wants, to be a, she wants to be a soldier in the Burmese army, but she wants to be in a different army because she wants to take back the country for the people, right? So when she wrote that, I, I must admit, I went to sheer panic because I didn't quite know how to break that down into gold ladder because I don't know what steps one must take to become a soldier in a different type of Burmese army. But the, 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 when I walk away from that class, I have to admit, we kind of um, coasted over that a little bit. But when I walked away from that class, I realized that although she was only 13 years old, she felt, something for, she felt something very deeply about the state of her country and she wanted to contribute, right? And at that point, that was what she felt was the way forward. When I walked away out of that class that day, I, I realized that it's very easy like, to get very self-absorbed and self-contained. Um, and, and it was a lesson to, to remind yourself that you must pop out of yourself, right? And, and, and actually be a bit plugged into the world because there is you know, like I said, somebody as young as 13 years old thinks quite differently, right? And, and, and quite, um, um, yeah, different, right? From, from how most of us would think. So that was a, a good lesson to not be 
so self-absorbed and centered. Um, the second thing is, um, for those who think it may be quite scary, uh, the Lord really works in mysterious ways. So you saw how he worked in, in Colin, right, through, through a lovely young lady. Um, but for, for me, it was, uh, when I first agreed to do this, I thought I was going to teach math, right? And then Chris said, no, we must teach them life skills. I said, well, but math is a life skill. He said, no, 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 that, that's hard skills. We must teach them values, right? And we're missing moral education. And then I, I, I was panicking because I was like, huh, I teach moral education. It needs to be somebody better, more worthy, right, to teach moral education. They said, no, no, it's okay, you can do it. Um, and, and I said, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Because one thing Chris did emphasize was when we do these causes, right, it must be structured. It must kind of feel like it's building on. So it cannot be like, like any oh how or, or casual or loose, right? So I, I felt that the Lord pointed me to, thank goodness, a whole load of resources that actually helped me then structure what a moral education class can look like for 12 and 13 year olds, right? Um, and, and be accessible and, and be credible for them as well. So, so the whole year, like I said, we, we teach them, I basically we, we teach them how to be proud of themselves, you know, how to take pride in what they do, um, how to have, um, uh, think about, you know, being this, right? To, to always do the right things, even if you're the only person doing it and all of that. So I kind of felt going from fear to like a curriculum and exams that the Lord really walked us through this journey to that, right? And so for anybody who ever wants to get access to an integrity wrap, uh, I have it on YouTube and in the Google Classroom, okay? So, so you can reach out to us for that. Um, last but not least, I, I think the, like I said, we're all busy working adults, okay? Uh, and one of the things that has come through very much through the COVID uh, last two years is the need to really, you know, take care of our mental health and all that. And I know this is, seems a little bit odd that spending two hours preparing for class and teaching is a good way to build your mental health. And, but I have to say that it is one of the best um, routes to building mental health simply because for two and a half hours, you are engaging with, with people that, you know, keeps you on your toes, keep you agile, makes you laugh. So suddenly you are out of the, the stress of the day, the stress of the week, the stress of the job, and, and you are giving yourself that break, right? Which is what we, we, you know, you read all these things the last two years about, well, stand I walk, stare at the green grass, and, and so on and so forth. I would recommend this method as well. Because not only is it a, a, a break, right? The minute you come back after those two hours at your work, you actually strangely feel very refreshed and very re-energized. Because I guess the kids are... I mean, they're, they're challenging. I mean, let me not be, you know, beat around the bush on that. But, but they, 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 in their challenge is extremely engaging, right? So, so, so it can be very heartwarming, uh, very, very heartwarming. Uh, so that, that's the thing. And last but not least, I will reiterate the call. You know, Jesus told us to be, you know, to be fishers of men, right? So I wanted to be, obviously, very inclusive. So do join us as a fisher person. Chris showed you, right, the hours required is really not daunting. However, your time, even that one, two hours, is absolutely invaluable to the kids that we teach. Now, he teaches us that when whatever we do to the least of the people amongst us, right, it is a way for us to build our pathway to, to, to life everlasting. So I think that, that time you spend, that one, two hours, is truly invaluable and really helps us um, help us, like I said, speak to the least amongst us, right? So do join us um, um, as a fisher person in 2022. You won't regret it. It's a fantastic experience. And now I'll hand back to Chris, who's giggling away because he knew, knows he conned me to do this. Right? <laughs> so he's very proud of himself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm smiling because you know, it's a constant reminder that really, you know, God, God is in charge. And even in preparing this whole thing, you know, I, I was a bit stuck. And I said in prayer, and says, dear Lord, help me, help me. And true enough, he made this possible. Uh, we, all, we have to end because we've got the next session. So I want to say thank you very much, everyone, uh, for uh, listening to us. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.